Welcome to another episode of the Trusted Advisor Podcast video series powered by the Retail Solutions Providers Association. Our goal on the pod is to accelerate the success of today's and tomorrow's leaders in the retail IT industry. I'm Jim Roddy, back with you again. Thank you so much for joining us. So throughout the year, we're talking with leaders about their leadership journeys and what they've learned along the way. And our guest today is Mike DeGiebert, North American Sales Manager for Epson, where he's been part of the team for 10 years. Mike has many years of experience in the retail technology industry, including sales and leadership roles at NCR, Intermec, and Fujitsu. Mike, welcome to the Trusted Advisor. Ah, good morning. Thanks for having me, Jim. No, it's uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to get to know you better today. So again, we are going to discuss at length your leadership journey. But sure. first, if you can give some context to our audience, can you share with us your career journey and what was the path that led you from where you were to become Epson's North America sales manager? Yeah, it's kind of funny. So I, I got into the point of sale business at a very early age, um, came from a, a family that was in the restaurant business. So I was integrated into hospitality at the age of 12, which, you know, <laughs> hanging around the, the, the restaurant doing things for my parents. And so it was kind of a unique start. So, you know, go off to college and get into computers because computers interested me and got a computer information degree and, you know, get out of college. You're like, well, what am I going to do with this? Because I liked programming, but I just could not see sitting at a desk programming for eight, 10 hours a day. And, you know, back in back in the 90s, how did you find a job? You opened a paper. And uh, I was living in Charlotte at the time and and found a uh, an ad for Century Data Systems. Uh, it, they said retail bar for hospitality grocery. I'm like, I don't know, really know what that is, but I know hospitality. I'm going to give this a shot. So gave them a call, went in and interviewed, got hired that day. And uh, that's kind of started my journey. So Century Data was probably my first lead into ICRDA. Yeah. Early on, I was going to the ICRDA meetings every every year, golf outings, you know, being in Charlotte um, and the roots being there and, and in North Carolina. Um, Clarence Wiggins was and uh, Wayne Williams were, were our leaders at the time, and they were highly, highly involved. I think we were doing the computers at the time. They actually branded their own computer that resellers sold. Um, so, yeah, I've got a, a long history with with RSPA. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, for folks who aren't familiar, ICRDA was the Independent Cash Register Dealers Association. That was the forerunner uh, to the association. And yeah, Clarence Wiggins is uh, is certainly legendary in this space. I, I'm curious, just can you go into a little more detail about your family uh, restaurant? Like, what kind of restaurant was it? What was your, you said you started there at age 12. What were you doing uh, at age 12? <laughs> at 12, I was, you know, washing dishes and busing and just running around and being a 12-year-old kid, right? Um Grew up in a small town in North Carolina called Tryon. Uh, it's near Hendersonville, Asheville, Greenville area, uh, kind of horse country. So it was a, uh, you know, steak, seafood. You know, this was before the days of Chili's and Applebee's. People would come to Tryon to go to my parents' restaurant. Friday and Saturday nights were just, you know, people from 30, 40 miles away would come come to have dinner. So it's, uh, it was interesting. So growing up, I was into sports and things like that or the whole Western North Carolina area and knew a lot of people from that and they would literally start coming to my parents restaurant <laughs> yeah so it uh it was interesting so it really was a a family family type business back then a little little different tremendous exit yeah certainly the landscape uh, of restaurants has changed uh significantly so yeah. l- let's talk about today so epson's prior north america sales manager was linda sutterth someone who sure. many rsp members knew well and greatly respected so linda retired but before that she was women to women leader of the year in the rspa she was a mentor to many folks in the industry she volunteered her time super sharp like great business acumen as well so can you talk about how you're going about stepping into the role of somebody who left very big shoes to fill, right? It's way yeah. different from stepping into a role where you have to turn things around or you're just, you're starting completely fresh. So talk about following uh, the great Linda Sutter. It's kind of funny because when I went through the interview process, I heard those very same things from some of our leaders and they kind of chuckled when they said it because my introduction into Epson was with Fujitsu. And, you know, we were a partner of Epson. They were our print solution. So I had met Linda over the years and Tim Latta over the years and had a lot of good relationships with Epson. And it was kind of funny when I first interviewed with her, she's like, you know, 
what would you want to do when you come to Epson? I was like, well, I want to go there and try to help grow your business. I said, my one concern is, you know, we're a print solution. You know, at Fujitsu, I sold people, you know, services, you know, everything you can think of when it came to, to, um, to the retail industry. And Linda was like, well, you know, I'll challenge you with that. You're going to have other opportunities. You're going to have other things you can do here. It's not just a printer. And, and it kind of opened my eyes to a lot of things because of her leadership skills and <laughs> the way she communicates. So when I first came on board, it was nice because Linda kind of empowered you to do things. She mentored me for 10 years uh, working directly for her. And I would say the last three years, she she kind of got me ready for this role. You know, we had a lot of discussions about where the channel as a whole is going, not just with Epson, but you, you see all the changes that have happened over the last five years with with the payment companies and the different ISVs that have come into the market. It's 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 evolving so that, you know, we, we've got to be a little better with our customers to be able to meet their challenges. So I would say that I've taken that kind of approach. Um, it's kind of different walking into a team that one day I was a, a team leader and a mentor on our team to now I'm leading the team, um, which was a little unique. And we had a lot of conversations about that uh, and, and what that would look like. So I, I've tried to take her piece of the channel, which if you talk to Linda, it's, it's integrity, it's partnerships, it's all the things that make a strong channel. Um, and I'm just trying to leverage those because she did a, an unbelievable job in 20 five years, you know, here yeah. at Epson leading this, this channel. So, and then she also gave me some things that she saw coming um, with these changes around, uh, around payments and other things and things that we need to do as a channel to change it. And uh, we, we've already started trying to look at those and start to implement those over the next 12 to 24 months. So she's still leaving her legacy with kind of a footprint of things she saw and the challenges she saw coming. So it's, uh, so far it's been great. Right. Yeah. And, so, and talk about that. If I can just follow up on one point of that is, you know, a lot of times when folks think about delegating, they think about here's these 10, 20, 30, 40 tasks that I need to show somebody how to do. But you went out of your way a couple of times to mention, we talked about the channel as a whole. We talked about the changes in the industry. Yeah. Can you talk about how important that is? Like talk to our audience about when they are delegating to somebody, you're not just teaching about the task. You have to talk about the whole concept. And can you talk about how that has helped you, you know, move into Linda's role and really develop uh, and be ready for this? Yeah, because it, it's going from, you know, tactical to strategic, right? We, we need to pick that one layer back and, and look at the channel as a whole because, you know, we the way Linda set up our channel, and it's kind of funny, she did it purposefully. You know, we've got our OEM VAR se segment, we've got our ISV segment, and then we've got our traditional VAR segment. So, and, th and they are unique and they are merging, right? So I, I think the biggest thing I've tried to do now with my team is, you know, just because you've been a traditional VAR you know, manager for the last 10 years, you now have OEM customers. You have people that want private label. They want branding. They want that you need to look at the bigger picture of what can we be to, to them to be more strategic and look at other pieces of their business that we do well, but you haven't really integrated in, in that to your customer because, you know, we've, we've lost some customers because we didn't look at that foresight of where are they going and we weren't really listening to the customer. We were kind of doing our day to day and you get so wrapped up into the day to day that you forget that there, there's a bigger component here with what's changing in industry. So that's kind of what I've tried to do is start integrating that into my team because I do have a unique background with, um, because if, if you looked at the channel back in the nineties, when I worked at NCR, they were a channel leader. I mean, mm -hmm. they went from, they had protected territories and that the, the loyalty that they had and the partnerships that they created were were so strong, and the, by the year two thousand, that was gone because mm -hmm. because of changes in the industry and the way they with the way the corporation thought they they should change that. So I'm trying to take some of those into the into my business as well. Um, and Linda, and I've talked about it. She's kind of taken my lead on some of them because the, those relationships you build with partnerships they last forever. And if you do one bad thing, they can be gone. So it's continually to build upon that. And I think that's what I've tried to do over the, the last six months with the team as far as now as the leader and, and the prior 10 years as a, a mentor and a, and a teammate. 
Yeah, and there's recognizing that your organization with, like you said, the day-to-day, it has an inertia that's moving in a certain direction. Sure. And it's very, very difficult to make any tweaks and changes because, man, that inertia is strong. Oh, it it is strong. (laughs) Yeah, no matter what size company. So so there's another dynamic in terms of Linda was based in Texas. You're based in Florida. Can you talk about that dynamic of now you're leading a team and everyone isn't in the same room or the same building together 40 hours a week? How how does that change the way uh, you uh, act as a leader? And and this is where I think I got lucky, right? So if you look at before the pandemic, what did we all do? We we all got together for our quarterly meetings and our bi yearly meetings and our yearly meetings and everybody tried to get together when you could and go into trade shows you just hopped on a plane right so in my career i've worked virtually for 25 years um and and it was a challenge right when even when you're on a team or trying to lead a team then the pandemic comes along and we're all sitting in an office and zoom and teams and all these tools came to us that we never had before really right they were there but people didn't really use them if, mm-hmm. if you got onto a to a Zoom call, not everybody turned on their cameras. Well, when the pandemic started, one thing our CEO did, Keith Kratzberg, he said, "Guys, cameras on. We, we we've got to be in front of our customers, and this is the only way to be in front of our customer is using the camera." He said, "And I don't care if the customer doesn't have theirs on. Yours is going to be on. If we're on internal meetings, I want them on." Now he goes, "I understand. You know, there might be a meeting, you know, morning that you've worked out and you're you're not fresh, you're not ready to jump on camera. That's fine." But the thing is, be in front of your customer. So now we've got the ability as a as a leader to be in front of our team. I mean, I'm on I'm mm-hmm. on Zoom calls every day with one of my team members. We're on biweekly calls, monthly calls. I mean, so we get together and you know, we might be the first piece, let's get the business stuff out. But hey, how are you guys doing? You know, what's going on with your family? You, there's more interaction you can have today in this virtual world than we've ever had before. And I think uh, as a leader, you need to leverage that and leverage it with your customers. Because I think pretty much all my customers now, when they get on that kind of didn't put their cameras on, now they want to get on. They want to see, hey, what do, you, what do you got in the background? Like, I'll put mm-hmm. different things up in the background and see if people notice. I'll change stuff around. And and then you just have a conversation. So it's, uh, it's definitely changed, but I think people need to embrace it. Yeah. So it sounds like what you're saying is there's like core leadership principles no, that no matter yeah. what the tools are, like core leadership principles, but you've got to make sure you really use the tools that are available to you and not just halfway, but use the tools all the way and use them frequently in order to have them, uh, you know, enable you to be a leader in today's day and age. Absolutely. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. I, is there anything you miss about not being in office? Like, I, and not, I'm saying you, like you personally, but you as a leader that you're like, man, I'm not gonna, not gonna understand that. And part of the reason I'm asking is selfishly, you know, the RSPA, we're a team of 10, we're all yeah. virtual as well. And so, you know, I, I've been in this office here now, moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, two and a half years. Yep. Not one of my coworkers has ever stepped foot <laughs> uh, in this office before, right? I only see them uh, on the screens or like I said, when we cross paths at trade shows. I'm just curious about what do you see as like, here's something that I that I know is a gap because we're not in the, the office all the time. Yeah, I, I think some things get missed from not being in the office and, and in front of people. Um, one of my roles was a hybrid role where I was going to an office and not an office. The time that you can get in front of a person, and, and it's the same thing with customers. And I talked to my team, is like, anytime a customer gives you the opportunity of doing a Zoom call or you fly in to see them, you fly and see them. I mean, the conversations you have one-on-one, like we're doing right now, is is great. But now get a Zoom call where you've got six people on it. How many times do you see you've got one person, you're not sure if they're looking at the screen or if they're reading email, what, <laughs> what they're doing, the right? they, think, they, yeah. they turn right here like, oh, my <laughs> camera's on, and you and, and you know, and you pick up on it. And and one thing I've tried to do in those calls is, hey, Steve, what do you think about that? Try to get pull them back. Well, in the office, yeah. it's a little different. It's face-to-face. Hey, what'd you do this weekend? What'd you about this? Hey, I saw so-and-so up front, you know, did they get this done for our project? Or so you have more of that that interaction where you can go get things done quick. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing we do, I mean, I, I probably get out to our corporate office about once a quarter, and you just you walk the halls, you go see the product managers, you go see the marketing folks, you go see the VPs and have the conversations, and and, and it's just face to face interactions still never going to replace 
by Zoom, but it's still very important because you you have conversations you'd never have unless it's one on one like this. Like yeah. you and I'll probably get into conversations that if there was a team, we'd never get there. Yeah. So that's why I try to do one on ones with my team at least once a month for an hour where yes. we just have this conversation because yeah. You start talking about things that you forgot about, or hey, we uh, we we put that as a goal we were going to do, and where are we? And you, know, you can have those candid conversations one on one. So that's that's the part I miss is it's more the cooler talk and bringing in um, and getting things done a lot quicker when you're face to face. We've actually added into our agenda now we, uh, for our weekly team meeting and lead off with it. Uh, personal, professional, best news for the week because oh, yeah. we know we don't you know usually you'd bump yeah. into someone in the hallway how's it going hey i gotta tell you this story or you know something of that nature well, we don't have right. that naturally happening and no one's going to be right. on a zoom call and be like let me tell you what i did this weekend okay bye <laughs> right exactly. and so we actually integrate that into our agenda like i said we start off with it to make sure that we're we're getting that because without that it just becomes a bunch of you know it's a transactional relationship right because right. everybody is just doing those right. things so yeah and you're like all right when's this call over so i can go get my work done and, yes yeah, yeah on to the next thing so yeah right or like you said in the middle of the call doing your work right sneaking off <laughs> right, to the side exactly. it's just a team of nature to do it so yeah. all right so that was some of the technical stuff let me you know we're going back and forth had you start you know at the beginning and then yeah. jump in today why don't you go back to early in your career uh in your leadership journey and so can you talk about a learning experience early on that has stuck with you for, for years and decades and influences you as a leader today? Yeah, so so I'll pull, pull in Mr. Krog on this one. So one, one of my sales leaders at, at NCR, Mark Krog, um, don't know if you know Mark, he's, he's been on the direct selling in the, in the Minnesota area for 30, 40 years, but very dynamic guy. But one thing he taught me really early on was because, I mean, I, I was younger at the time, right, in my 20s, and I would get kind of uppity and hot-headed about stuff like, no, we got to go do this. We got to do it now. And he'd be like, no, no, let's bring this back. He goes, Mike, start writing things down. He goes, he goes you, you need to level set with what you're really looking for. Write it down. Walk away from it. Come back and revisit it and then continue that writing and then act upon it. So his whole thing was, you know, don't do things he did you know, make sure you think it through and then revisit it before you actually make it an actionable um, and purposeful statement that you're trying to do. He goes, just come in here, tell me you need that. Well, that doesn't really give me the full story. And you and I got 10 or 15 minutes for this conversation. And it's on to the next thing. So that, that's that stuck for, with me real early on. And, and his next big thing was when you do write it down, read through it. Mm -hmm. Don't don't just go through and like, yeah, I got it. Because look in today's age. I mean, some of the, the IMs we get and the text messages, it's like, did people really think through that before they sent it? Because <laughs> the way I'm reading it is not the way they sent it. And you yeah. and you kind of read through it, right? So it, it it's kind of, especially with the digital age, it, it helps, right? I don't want to send an email to you that, that doesn't really hit the points we're looking for. And then I can do the friendly fluff at the end. But mm -hmm. hit, hit up front the concise piece you're trying to get to. Because when you're dealing with the nice piece when I worked at Fujitsu was calling on C-level leaders, you're, you're going to get them in the first paragraph or first two sentences and everything else, not, it's, it's gone. So if yes. you didn't get your, your point across, you've lost them. Yep. So he, he taught me that really early on. So as my career advanced that you, you really try to be purposeful in everything you do. And yeah, M Mark was a, a good mentor and a, a good friend. So it's a... Uh, goes back to when we were when, when you sent the list of kind of questions we might talk through and you start thinking about those memories you're like god man that was nice when we got to, <laughs> to to your point face to face and have those meetings and and uh yeah it's great uh, so, so i am thrilled to hear you share this because i before my role i would do a lot of uh, team training customer service training and one of the notes was when you're handling an upset customer to actively listen and to support oh, yes. your active listening take notes like as many notes as you can because there's just something about human nature where you can't yell back at somebody as you are writing down and taking notes right it has some right. level setting from an emotional standpoint right. to it so did did it have that effect on you right away or were you like this is i'm not going to do this why would you like can, can you talk about that like did it have an immediate impact on you it, it did because when he was giving me this coaching advice we were dealing with a pretty upset customer that wanted to go in a certain direction that wasn't our direction. 
And I just wanted to solve it. And I wanted to make it happen. So it kind of did stick with me because it was a large customer at the time for NCR. And it was um, something that I felt if we if we don't do this, we're going to lose them. And he's like, oh, no, yeah. wait a minute. Let's, let's see what they're really trying to get to. And it did kind of stick with me. But to your point, when you write it down and you think it through and you get the emotion out of it, you have yeah. a much better outcome. And I, I, I see myself now as I, I start writing things down. By the time I answer something that's important like that, it's way different from where I started. Yes. And yeah, but yeah it, it stuck with me kind of early on. <laughs> yeah, have the mindset of a neutral investigator trying to fully understand the situation as opposed to someone who's just reacting or I got to give an answer. Right. Got to give an so. answer. Because that's one one thing I've done as a mentor over the years is sometimes less is more. Let the customer yep. talk to you. Let them talk through <laughs> their, they have an aggravation for a reason. And they're not asking you to solve it this very second. They're wanting you to hear what's going on and take that time because sometimes a knee-jerk reaction kind of loses its fizz anyway because, yes. well, you didn't think through that. You didn't go work with your team. So it's, I think it's just a, a good lesson. Um, I had an interview with a college student, uh, gosh, about six months ago, and he was asking me those, some of those kind of questions. And, and, and I, and I was, that, that was kind of my coaching to him is less is more. Because as mm-hmm. soon as you and I got on this conversation, you wanted to talk. And, it, and it's not, it, it's, it's about a conversation. Yeah. And, I, and those are the things you want to do for the next generation coming up. So they understand it's not all about talking. It's about listening, especially yes. when it comes to relationships. Yes. Um, no, well said. So that was a, a lesson early in your career. Can you talk about a learning experience maybe later in your career? There was maybe a difficult time that you ended up overcoming and, and what you learned from that. I, I think we can all relate to this, the pandemic. Yes. Uh, the supply chain issues that were caused through the pandemic were, you know, unfathomable. I mean, we're, we're still dealing with it today. Some of the effects that happened to us four years ago, right? Mm-hmm. And early on, when it, when it started getting to that point, because my, my role being a little different, dealing with our OEMs, our large customers are you know doing millions and millions of dollars of business a year that we're only a part of the solution here at Epson. You know, we're a key part, but we're, we're, we're a small part when you look at the overall solution that goes into a grocery store or a restaurant or a retail store. So very, very trying to see the word for it. it's just, just just critical to be able to react to what they need right okay so when we started with the supply chain you know it was oh well, you know what we're looking at three to six month lead times now we got this i went to my customers earlier and i said look i need six to 12 month po's from you we need to look for you through your historicals let's get the let's get ahead of this let's get inventory coming in and two of my largest customers up until the last couple months they didn't feel the pain of some of our other customers did because they didn't react to that. They're like, well, yeah, we'll we'll keep we'll keep relying on the distributor to have product for us. And this, I'm like, well, you know, you might not be able to rely on that because we're going to have to just spread around what we have. So I think being proactive taught it taught me a lot of things using that proactiveness up front, talking to your customers, letting them know this could get really bad, guys. I mean, you've got a rollout coming up, yeah. and if you don't have the print solution, you can't roll out or you don't have the handheld or you don't have the cash drawer, it, all the components to go together to make the solution. So I think there are a lot of conversations had around the pandemic that we've never had before as a salesperson. You know? uh, yeah, and, and frank conversations, it sounds like what you're saying, there's an element of being proactive, but then also making sure the active part of that isn't a half step. It's really it's making a... sure you're going, my old boss used to say, kill an ant with an anvil, right? Just don't squash it with your finger. Like, boom, like you are make sh- making sure that this is not going to be a problem. I understand, my understanding that's kind of the lesson was be proactive, but just 100%. don't fall short, like making sure that the proactive action that you're taking really gets the job done and then some. Yeah, I mean, it, it's okay to be, have a stern conversation with your customer. Like, we got to do this. I mean, I know this is outside the norm, but we don't have a choice. Yeah, And having those conversations early on definitely help but that proactiveness is is something that i still kind of teach to my team (laughs) even the last couple couple months i'm like guys i need to be especially with some of the changes we have now right so you had that whole build up of the pandemic well 
the market kind of softened because all that money and everything they had to spend is kind of gone, right? And now we're yeah. back to, you know, 2017, 18 type levels because that bubble, that bubble's gone. So you need to be proactive in front of your customers so that your our competitors aren't in there poaching some of the business that that you think is good, but it yep. might not be because they might be watching their their nickels and dimes and trying to figure out where they can save a little money for the same type of solution. And so it's yeah, proactiveness is yep. is key in this in yeah, this channel business. It reminds me of two quotes. There's no substitute for a competent person getting closer <laughs> to a situation. And right, if you think you're close, you're maybe not close enough, like get even closer. And then uh, when my, my wife and I, we have uh, one daughter, and my, when my wife was pregnant, you know, always asking her OB questions. Right. And her OB would say, a little neurosis never hurt anybody. <laughs> like it's good to, to act and right, make sure and ask the question as opposed to, I'm sure everything's fine and, and right. reacting from there. So, yeah, we, we can learn from anywhere in this world. So, um, well, let's pause here uh, for a quick message to let our listeners and viewers know about the Retail Solutions Providers Association. The RSP is North America's largest community of retail technology VARs, software providers, vendors, and distributors. Members benefit from RSPA White Glove Service, which is provided by the member services team of Peggy Fry, Nicole Green, and Ashley Nagy. Instead of leaving you on your own to navigate our growing list of member companies, Peggy, Nicole, and Ashley will make warm one-on-one -on -one introductions on your behalf to fellow members who can accelerate your success. Success. To learn more, email membership at gorspa.org. Now, uh, this next uh, commercial, Mark, is going to include a quiz uh, for you. So it's thank, uh, thanking the RSP sponsors who support our community and make this podcast and video series possible. Our platinum sponsors, Blue Star. Our gold sponsors are CoCard, Heartland, ScanSource. And can you name the fourth company? Better be Epson. <laughs> it is Epson, yes. That would be, that'd be really awful if I uh, turned the tables on you, uh, yeah. and it wasn't. Yeah, so thanks to Cocard, Epson, Heartland, ScanSource, and Blue Star for sponsoring this podcast. And finally, registration is now open for Inspire 2025, the Retail IT Channel's premier leadership conference. RSP is Inspire is set for January 26th through 29th in Curacao. For more information, visit gorspa.org forward slash Inspire so you can experience networking Nirvana. So uh, let's talk now. We talked about some experiences that have taught you. Let's talk about some of the people uh, who have taught you. Who are some leaders that you look up to as mentors and have helped you shape your leadership approach? And then who are they and what specifically did they do that's had a lasting impact on you? Yeah, we kind of talked through Linda. I mean, she's definitely had a, a, a huge, huge <laughs> uh, help to my career and the things I've done at Epson. But when, when I go back through my NCR days, NCR was a great leadership training platform. I mean, you, you went to educations up in Sugar Camp, up in Dayton. And from that, the leaders that you dealt with were, were just fantastic. Uh, Gordy Meister and Dave Strawler, don't know if you know those names, mm -hmm. but they were they were kind of icons the way they set up their channel and the way they they did the events and how they got people engaged. Um, and, and when you looked at all the people that work for them, they bought into it. And from that, the partners bought into it. So uh, I, I got to do a lot of traveling with with Dave Strawler. Um, luckily enough, now I get to work with Doug Strawler, his son. He actually works at Epson. And yeah, so yeah. Doug, Doug and I have known each other for 25 years. Um, goes back to the relationship piece, right? So D Dave had a, a, a high impact on the way I did things. You know, he was such a, I mean, same thing, purposeful. When he talked to you, you know, he wanted to have a good conversation. He wanted to listen to you. He wasn't a dictator, dictator that told you this is the way things are going to be done. He's like, oh, well, you know, what are you doing with this partner? You know, why are you doing it that way? Well, have you thought about this? So for him, it was always developing and working through the conversations the, to make sure that the partner was getting everything they needed from us. And starting at Century Data, being a partner and seeing how I was treated by the different OEMs, um, and NCR, the reason I went from Century Data to NCR was because of that, the way they treated the partners. And, they, you know, you got on the phone with them and they cared about what you were asking about. Yeah. Um, and, and all that came from Gordy and Dave, which is kind of funny, right? So the experiences that I had at Century Data were in, were in, reflected from the, the work they had done, you know, years, years in past to get their channel the way it was. So they definitely had a, from a channel perspective, had a huge impact on my me and my career um and another ncr guy dale grant 
uh, he ran our, our kind of more of our direct side of the business. So I've, through my career, I worked both channel and direct. So I've kind of had a unique perspective, channel, direct, ISV, OEM. I've kind of done the whole gamut. Um, and, and Dale was the same way. He, he was challenging as far as, you know, why are you doing that for your account? So let me talk. And so he could see and critique that way as opposed to you should do it in this way. And I think that's the one thing I got from NCR. There was a lot of conversations, not a lot of dictatorship where yeah. you've got to do it this way. There was the NCR sales way, but they want to make sure that you're thinking outside the box. Um, so I, I got a lot of good mentors when it came to, I think of all the sales leaders that I had from Mark Crow to Dale Grant to, you know, Gordy and Dave and um, Mike Webster. I don't know if you knew Mike for he was mm -hmm. at Oracle mm -hmm. for years as well as NCR. You know, Mike, he was he was such a good leader because he, his belief was you be early, you be prepared. And what he meant by that is, you know, you, you get to a customer 30 minutes off early to their office. You're going to you're going to see somebody in the waiting room that's either a competitor or somebody you should be partnering with to help you in that account. Mm -hmm. Be prepared. Like if you've got an hour presentation, you better be working five or six hours on that presentation before you yeah. actually present. And it's just those type things that my career at NCR really got me ready for when I changed over to Intermec and kind of the things I did at Fujitsu. And then now here at Epson, it's it gave me a pretty good base. So I'd say my my early mentorships probably lasted the longer, the longest. And then Linda is probably the most impactful because she's got me ready for this next chapter of my yes. life and, and running the channel here at, uh, at Epson. Yeah. No, thank you for that. A lot of great lessons out of that. First, just a personal point. Uh, Doug Strahler was like one of the first person, one of the first people I met in this industry. The first ever okay. event I attended was, it wasn't even called Inspire back then, but it was 2006, the RSP Winter Conference. Yep. It was in Jamaica. And instead of hotels, they put everybody like in these villas is what it was. So you were okay. sharing breakfast and lunch in the villas with like a half dozen other people. Doug Strahler was with APG Cash Drawer yep. at the yep. time. He and Mark Olson were in uh, yep. my villa and that has changed the trajectory of my uh, career. Mark was very helpful in introducing me to people. And Doug sure. was like you want to talk about the unvarnished truth like doug was very much in terms of right like hey here's how yeah. it is like here's the reality uh yeah. of it so uh, awesome that we have that our paths have, have crossed there i do want to ask you to expand on one point uh that you sure. had in there i always love when people bring up leadership isn't about just a bunch of tactics and techniques and manipulation tools like it starts with genuinely caring about the people that you're leading and it seems like you touched on that and you learned that from you know all these leaders it seems like it has a very similar through line can you expand upon that in terms of like when somebody wants to lead really care about your people and that you can build upon that but if you don't have that it's not going to work it sounds like the folks who you learn from they very much believe that and lived it preached it yeah, I mean, you, you have to care about the people. I mean, if, if you look at, because I've managed people in the past, you end up building both a personal and a business relationship, right? And, and it's key that you learn both, right? How is this person personally as well as how are they in business? Why do they do what they do? And I think that builds a trust and, and the type of influence you can have on them and the things they're doing uh, comes from that trust. So building a relationship is is probably number one. Uh, I, I I think everybody I've ever worked with you know that personal side and the business side, but you got to separate them. I think some leaders fall into that, and I, I've seen it where ah they're too a little too buddy buddy and friendly yeah. with the people that they're leading when it comes to the daily conversations. But as soon as five o'clock comes. You can talk about the Knicks game. You can jump into why are you a Falcons fan and why, you know, all the different things that you do outside of work. You kind of separate the two, but the two do coincide. And, and it's key to that relationship building piece that you've, you've got you've to learn about people to get the trust from the people. And, yeah, I learned that very early on, you know. But a lot of, you know, late night sitting, having a couple pops at, at the bar or, you know, a long round of golf and, you start learning this manager, he's really there for you, even though he might be real pain in the you know what sometimes. Mm -hmm. He's doing it for a reason because you've built that trust. And it, now he's got the influence over you from doing that trust. 
So yeah, that, that's why I like a long in-depth interviewing process, free employment interviewing process to really get to know the person, not just sure. what's on their their resume. Because like you said, you're managing the whole person. You're not just managing an automaton, right? Who's right. in here to perform a certain job. You're you're managing people. So right. and and can we talk about how you manage people? How would you describe your leadership style? Right? Are there a few overarching words or phrases that represent what you're striving for as a leader? So, so this one will kind of be near and dear to your heart. I mean, my, my management style is kind of a coaching style. You know, a coach has to do a, a game plan. They've got to do recruitment. They have to do everything to get ready for that game. Well, every customer, every meeting, you're, you have to get ready for it. So it's I've tried to do more of the coaching piece of it to where you empower your, your people that work for you. You build that trust. You look at what you're doing with your customers, that the relationship is being built and it's built off of trust and all the pieces that you you think are probably second nature. Right? Oh, this should just happen. It doesn't just happen. You have to think through and be purposeful of what mm -hmm. you're doing. So I try to take that coaching style. Um, you know, I'm, you're, you're building a team. You're taking that team, whatever team that is, because it changes everything. The environment changes. The market changes. Heck, people's daily lives change, right? Sure. You'll have people on your team that they're, they're going through some personal things that could affect their work if you don't properly look at it. And, you know, how are we going to make this work for you as a person? And then I'll tell you how it's going to work for Epson. Because if you don't get them on and, and playing with what they need to be doing, you know, the work's going to, it's going to be hurt by it. So sometimes stepping away is not a bad thing. <laughs> no. Excellent. No, thank you for that. My last question for you is, and I'll put in the context of what folks have heard throughout this interview, right? You and I are able to talk about, oh, the ICRDA, right? And Sugar <laughs> Camp and Gordy Meister, right? Like, yeah. I, you know, it's great to have his his uh, name on here, Dave Strahl, right? Going back in time. So some folks might think, well, you know, Mike's been leading for a long time. He doesn't have to learn anymore. But are there things you do today to keep your leadership skill leadership skills sharp and then also improve on your leadership skills? Can you talk about that development isn't just a thing in the past? What do you do today to continue to develop as a leader? It, it's not. So here you, I'll give you a couple of uh, tools, right? So as soon as I got this job, this is the first book I bought because I was like, you know what? So the, go back. I, for the, those the who are just listening on audio, it's called The First 90 Days. So it's a great read, right? I mean, a lot of these books, you, you read through them, you're like, oh, that's common sense. But it kind of gives you some steps that you should be looking for. Like, you know, like, what should I do pre to prepare myself for now taking a team that I used to work with and now leading the team? And how do I get the same influence I'm looking for that Linda had? And how do, it, to, how do I make it Mike's team and not Linda's team? Because, you know, the first few months, oh, yeah, this is Linda's replacement. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great, but there's a little more to it than that, right? So the one nice thing about this book, it, it talks about influence and how you work through preparing and how, how you look at your team and goes back to writing things down, evaluate the first 90 days. Don't jump in and try to change something. Don't try to put your influence of how you think the organization should look. So I would say the key is, is reading. Um, Another one that I'm getting ready to read because we, we've had a couple, <laughs> a couple bumps at work. Um, it's like how, how you can lose credibility. So this one, this one's a little shiny, but it's called what, so oh, so ahead. smart, so smart, but. Okay, and, and it's and, with one T, just for everybody. Uh, yeah, one, yeah, the but is yeah, one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one T. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's talking about how you can lose credibility and how you gain it back, and I think. Um, huh. Just reading through it because it hasn't really happened to me, but I've seen it happening. And Doug, actually, Doug Strawler gave me this book because he read it. He goes, hey, because he had a couple challenges and he's like trying to overcome some. Start reading this. Guy, Mike, he goes, some of the points in this book are just spot on. And he goes, it might be one or two sentences you get out of the whole book, but it'll be worth the read. So I think it's just reading, staying up on things. I don't know, I'm, I'm sure since you're you love podcasts and you like getting involved with things like that. I'm sure you watch other guys on podcasts and how they do things and mm -hmm. what are some of the, the, the question types that they want to do to get sure. the right response. I just say it's don't don't just rely on the past because yeah, the past is great, but the market's changing, the channel's changing. You know, change is one thing that's going to be constant. 
Yeah. And the people are changing, right? The experiences oh. <laughs> of employees now is, you know, for folks who came out of college in the last 10 years is sure. way different from the experiences that you and I had. And so you've got to make sure you understand what those are. Right. To, to my point, how did I find my first job? A paper. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to today, you know, jump on LinkedIn and you can find about any co contact or job you want to look at. Right. So it's it's a it's a different world we live in. Right. And in fact, I was just communicating with one of my old, I used to work in the magazine industry for many, many years and talking about, you know, how different that is. And like the newspaper industry, it was incredibly profitable, very stable sure. until it wasn't. And then it just blew up. And I think that's, I, I know that that might scare folks to think like, ah, what we're doing now, it could all blow up. But that's the reality of it, right? We've got to make sure as leaders, we're not doing it based on old information. There are life, there are lessons that last forever and ever, sure. right? The, the principles, but to your point, there's, there's a lot that changed. I guess if you want to give the final word, I said my final question, but if you want to give the final word <laughs> in terms of, of keeping ahead of change and how important that is for you as a leader and for Epson as, as a company, because uh, of how different the hardware game has changed. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're kind of going through it right now. I mean, the market is changing with, and, from I discussed it early on, you know, the, the payments industry has kind of brought themselves into the point of sale space heavily, right? You know, you've got you've got the shift fours of the world and toast and all these guys that are, that are doing different things and that they were not really a competitor 10 years ago. Five years ago they started to be. Well now they're they're front and center. I think I think toast is up to something like eleven percent market share. Mm -hmm. And an NCR or an HP or an IBM, Toshiba, they look back that they would have never saw that coming. Like there's, you know, the payments guys, it, they do their thing. We'll, we'll integrate with them and move right. on. But I think that's what my team and I are trying to do is what, what is changing in the market with our, with the payment guys, with the ISVs, um, with the integration pieces that we as a printer company never dealt with in the past and try to stay ahead of it. Because, uh, because change is uh, one thing that's constant. Yeah. And if you're if you're not looking at the next thing that's coming, well, <laughs> you're going to be get left behind. That's right. And then those are great questions to ask. They're not easy questions to answer. No. But if you don't try your best to answer them, someone else is going to fill in the blank uh, right. for you, and you're going to be left behind. Right. Excellent. Well, that does it for this episode of The Trusted Advisor. If you enjoyed our discussion, be sure to subscribe to the RSP YouTube channel and The Trusted Advisor podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you'd like to learn more best practices for VARs and ISVs in the retail technology industry, check out the RSP blog. You can find it at GoRSP.org and then clicking on RSP blog. Before we go, big thanks again to Mike DeGiebert for sharing his wisdom with us today. Thanks also to RSP marketing director Chris Arnold for his production work, Joseph McDade for our music, and last but not least, thanks so much to you for listening. Our goal at the RSP is to accelerate the success of our members in the retail technology ecosystem by providing knowledge and connections. For more information, visit our website at gorspa.org. Thanks for listening and goodbye, everybody.